And why don't we get started? Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Hartnett. I'm the Executive Director of the Cardiovascular Institute of Philadelphia. Thank you for joining us for this plaque CDI program. You know, it's sad to think that three months ago, we were, many of us were together on the rooftop at the Lowe's Hotel for our last plaque program with Dr. Rader. And prior to that, at the Prime Rib Restaurant for a previous program in the fall. And our hope is that given another six months or so, hopefully before the end of the year, we'll all be back together and can be doing one of these programs together at one of those lovely locations. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Dr. Dean Corrales, Dr. Monica Sangavi, and Dr. Daniel Safar, who will be tonight's presenters. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Corrales. Thank you all again for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I think many of you know me. For those who don't, I'm Dean Corrales and, and one of the course directors uh, for PLAC. Um, on behalf of myself and my co-host, Dan Soffer and Dr. Monica Sangavi, I'd like to welcome you to our first virtual CVI and plaque educational program, Preventive Cardiology in the Era of COVID-19. This evening's program is organized by the Cardiovascular Institute of Philadelphia in partnership with PLAC, the Philadelphia Lipid and Atherosclerosis Club. But before I start, I want to share a few exciting things with you. CVI has launched a new website. And you can see it here. Um, and the address is the same as before. You can see it at the top of the slide, cviphiladelphia.org. And there you'll find the most up-to-date program information and much, much more, which includes the CVI Heartbites, which were recently launched. CVI Heartbites is a free non-accredited educational program produced by the CVI, which features succinct presentations delivered by leading experts on timely topics in cardiovascular medicine. Our first series focused on cardiovascular disease in the age of COVID-19, and listed here are the recently released sessions of the topic. Stay tuned and you can see below for the cardiometabolic disease series, which is coming soon. Now, before we move on to this evening's program, I would like to take some time and thank the plaque course directors, uh, Dr. Doug Jacoby, Dr. Tom Fiambolis, Dr. Dan Soffer, Dr. Ed Goldenberg, and also Dr. Perry Weinstock. I also want to thank for the, our generous exhibitors who have helped make this program possible, our host level exhibitors, Axia Therapeutics um, and Conecuh Pharma America. Should you have any questions, feel free to submit your questions anytime during the presentations. Type your question into the Q&A box and the QA session will take place after the completion of all three presentations. Now, these have truly been challenging and difficult times as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna start by first thanking all of you for your hard work and for the care that you've provided your patients during this pandemic but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And by supporting each other, both professionally and personally, we will come through this. Tonight's program is a way to share education, but more importantly, it's a way for us to be together and rekindle the camaraderie that we've developed over the years at CBI and at our plaque meetings. So let's toast ourselves. And for those of you who have a glass, let's raise the glass and honor the region's healthcare heroes. Cheers, Dean. To all of us. Now, the focus of tonight's meeting is preventive cardiology in the COVID-19 area, and we have three topics to discuss. The first, which I'll present, is our statin safe in patients with COVID-19. Then Dr. Monica Sangavi will present the role of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in COVID-19 patients. And finally, Dan Soffer will discuss issues related to LDL apheresis in the age of COVID-19. Then we can open it up to what I hope will be a fun and lively discussion. 
So let's get started. Are statins safe in patients with COVID-19? So as a background, as of early May, there have been over 1.3 million COVID-19 cases and almost 80,000 COVID-19 related deaths in the United States. As of today, that number is over 1.4 million COVID-19 cases and over 85,000 COVID-19 related deaths. And the numbers are only rising. And there's concern that this fall, that there'll be another outbreak of COVID-19. We now know that the risk factors for serious complications from COVID-19 include older age, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. And those are the same risk factors that we use to know when we should initiate statin therapy to reduce cardiovascular risk. And in fact, many of the patients who are being treated with a statin may develop COVID-19 or have an indication for one. There's a hyperinflammatory response to the virus that plays a key role in causing the severe complications from COVID-19. And cardiac involvement in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 is common and contributes to up to 40% of the deaths related to the virus. We know that statins lower LDL cholesterol, but more importantly, they improve cardiovascular outcomes and they have anti-inflammatory properties. So could statins not only improve cardiovascular risk in patients at risk or with COVID-19, but could the anti-inflammatory properties have benefits in reducing the se severe complications associated with COVID-19. On the other hand, LDL cholesterol can fall significantly in patients with acute COVID-19 infections. And the more severe the disease and the more severe the complications, the lower the LDL cholesterol falls. So there may be concern that lowering LDL cholesterol further with statin therapy in patients with severe COVID infections may actually worsen their prognosis and increase the risk for serious complications. So the questions that we need to ask is, are statins safe in patients with or at risk for COVID-19? And can they reduce the complications of COVID-19? So what would be the mechanism and how could statins improve outcomes in COVID-19 patients? Now, toll-like receptors are an important sensor protein that plays a key role in the innate immune system. When a virus such as COVID-19 enters the body, the toll-like receptors are activated. This in turn activates other proteins which lead to a cascade which either increases inflammation or has anti-inflammatory effects. When the toll-like receptors are activated in the setting of COVID-19, they activate a protein MyD88, which leads to an inflammatory reaction and release of inflammatory cytokines. On the other hand, when toll-like receptors activate TRIF, this leads to an anti-inflammatory effect and actually suppresses viral replication. In animal models, stands have been shown to blunt the downstream effect of increasing inflammatory cytokines in the setting of coronavirus infections by blunting what happens in the downstream related to MyD88. And that may be the mechanism, or at least the rationale, for how statins can improve outcomes in viral infections such as COVID-19. That is by blunting this hyperinflammatory reaction, which then leads to the more serious complications from viral infections such as COVID-19. Now, there have been some studies which suggest that statins can reduce complications associated with viral infections. In one study of over 3,000 patients who had laboratory-confirmed influenza, patients treated with statins had lower odds of death at 30 days than those not on statin therapy. In a much larger study of over a million patients, those who were on a statin was associated with a small protective effect against hospitalization for pneumonia, 30-day pneumonia death, and all-cause death related to influenza. However, there was confounding, and in meta-analysis, the benefit was not as great as it was in univariate analysis.
Marl, I don't, can you change the slides? Let's see if we can get this back. Oops, small technical difficulties. All right, well, well, we'll keep moving along once we can get these slides back up. So while they're bringing up the slides, those two trials in influenza show that there may be some benefit with regard to standard therapy. And a more recent trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at patients over 9,000 that were hospitalized with COVID-19 infection and 10% were on statin therapy. And those individuals who were on statins had a significantly better odds of surviving and being discharged from the hospital than patients who were not on statin therapy. So I guess, we, I don't know if we have the slides up here. Dean, while, uh, while Marlo's working on that, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you good. So we're working on the slides, but I guess the take -home, there are a couple of take home messages, and while we're waiting for those to go up, we can go over what these take home messages are. First of all, I think that if you're right now with in regard to the COVID-19 era, we need to recognize that there are that patients who are put on statins may have muscle related symptoms and muscle related symptoms have been described in patients with COVID-19. But the more typical side effects or the most typical symptoms of fever, cough and shortness of breath are not associated with statin associated side effects. So we should be able to distinguish as clinicians statin associated side effects as it relates to um, symptoms associated with COVID-19. And more rapid testing once it becomes available should help either exclude or, oh, maybe we got it back up running now, either exclude or make the diagnosis of COVID-19. In patients who are, in patients in, in the era of COVID-19, we should continue statins as prescribed when indicated by current guidelines. For patients who have uncomplicated COVID-19 infections, statins should be continued. That is because they reduce cardiovascular events. For hospitalized patients with COVID-19, continuing the statin should be weighed against the risk of rhabdomyolysis or liver dysfunction that may occur in severely COVID-19 patients. So to conclude, we know that statins reduce cardiovascular events. Whether or not they reduce the complications associated with COVID-19 are unclear. But what we do know from the observational evidence, along with patients infected with other coronaviruses, it provides support that statins are safe in the era of COVID-19. So thank you, and I'm gonna move on to the next presentation, and hopefully we won't have any more issues with these technical limitations. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Monica Sangavi. Monica is a cardiologist at the University of Pennsylvania and director of the inpatient consult service. Her area of expertise is women's cardiovascular health and prevention. She is currently the chair for the Pennsylvania American College of Cardiology Women in Cardiology chapter and serves on the National American Heart Association Women in Cardiology Committee. And she'll be discussing the role of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in COVID-19 patients. Monica, the stage is yours.
Thank you so much, Dr. Corrales. Um, I would like to also give a shout out to all the frontline workers who are fighting tirelessly against really an invisible war and a, a, a war against an invisible enemy. So what I want to talk about today is RAS inhibition and COVID-19. What I'd like to talk about is, excuse me, sorry. What I'm going to talk about is the controversy and the basis for the current controversy, current recommendations from our societies, current data, and ongoing trials. You know, um, one of the, the, there's a lot of controversy around RAS inhibition and COVID-19. And the basis for this controversy comes from some physiologic data that we know about the virus, as well as some early clinical data. We know that SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, enters the cell, the cell via the transmembrane ACE2 receptor. And some animal models have shown that RAS inhibitors, such as ACE and ARBs, may upregulate ACE2 receptors on the cell membrane. So if there's upregulation of ACE2 receptors on the cell membrane, there's been concern that there could be increased risk for um, virility and increased risk for worse, uh, worse disease in patients who have upregulation of ACE2. We also know that once the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the cell, that the ACE2 is actually downregulated on the cell membrane. So given this um, physiologic data that we understand that SARS-CoV-2 enters the cell via the ACE2 transmembrane receptor and some early clinical data from Wuhan, China that showed in two hospitals, they looked at the epidemiologic data from the patients that were admitted there, and they saw an overrepresentation of patients with hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. The concern was that all these conditions use RAS inhibition as a part of the treatment. And one of the concerns was, could the RAS inhibition be increasing the risk um, of developing COVID-19 in these patients. And then also they noticed that people who did not survive from COVID-19 also had a higher rate of, um, had a higher prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, coronary disease. And so there was concern that there was um, increased risk for severe disease in patients receiving RAS inhibition. For those who don't remember the um, angiotensin pathway, I want to remind you that angiotensinogen that's stored in the liver is converted to angiotensin 1 by renin, and then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, which is a vasoconstrictor by angiotensin converting enzyme or the ACE, um, ACE enzyme and ACE inhibitors act against this ACE enzyme to prevent conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. ACE2, which is what we've been talking about, actually acts to help counter-regulate this um, RAS pathway by converting angiotensin 2 to angiotensinogen. And angiotensin, and angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor versus, whereas angiotensin Tensin is a vasodilator and almost may have a protective mechanism in patients. And so that brings about the, the other side of the controversy because some people feel that maybe if we have upregulation of ACE2, it might protect from hyperactivation of the renin angiotensin al aldosterone system. And some additional data to support that idea that maybe ACE2 might be protective. Um, what is the study from, that was published in the British Medical Journal in 2012 that showed that there was maybe a protective role of ACE inhibitors, but not ARBs in the risk of pneumonia. And this 
uh, protective mechanism may be um, race dependent or dependent on certain disease processes. But this, this idea that ACE inhibitors may be protective um, serves as this, the opposing view in this controversy. So there are some who believe that um, RAS inhibition could be harmful because it upregulates the ACE2 receptors and increases the port of entry for the virus. And others who th thought that ACE inhibitors or ARBs may be protective um, because they upregulate um, ACE2, which may counterbalance the RAS system. From this came um, lots of editorials and um, lots of statements from different institutions about stopping ACE inhibitors or not stopping ACE inhibitors, and therefore, um, three of the ma major societies within cardiology, the HFSA, the ACC, and the AHA, put out a statement recommending continuation of RAS antagonists for those who are currently prescribed such agents. And the bottom line was that they, we don't know if RAS inhibition is beneficial or harmful in COVID, but we do know that RAS inhibition is helpful in certain underlying cardiac conditions, such as heart failure, hypertension, and ischemic heart disease. And so it is better to continue the RAS, continue the RAS antagonist for known benefit rather than discontinue, discontinue um, for unknown effect and they called for additional research on this topic. Fortunately, we have seen additional research on this topic, and actually May 1st, there were three simultaneous publications on this topic in the New England Journal of Medicine. And although each of these studies has its limitations and, they, and none of them are randomized studies, what I think adds power to these studies is the fact that the fact that all three of these um, uh, suggested the same outcome, the same uh, that there was no associated risk um, with these medications. And I'm gonna go through each one of them. The first one that I wanna talk about was actually conducted at NYU and they looked at 12,000 COVID patients, co sorry, 12,000 patients who were tested for COVID and about 47% of them were positive and 53% of them were negative and 17% had severe disease, which was um, defined as an ICU admission, death or requiring mechanical ventilation. And what they looked at is they looked at five classes of antihypertensives, which included ACE and ARBs, beta blockers, calcium channel blocker and thiazide diuretics and tried to see was there an increased likelihood of positive, a positive of COVID test or an increased likelihood of severe disease um, in any of these five classes of medications. And they did not find that to be the case. So they found no substantial increase in the likelihood of a positive test for COVID-19 or in the risk of severe COVID-19 among patients who tested positive and who were on the, these antihypertensive medications. This, this second study that I want to talk about was conducted in Lombardy, Italy, and it was actually a case control study. And they looked at 6,000 um, cases and used a one to five uh, ratio for, and had about 30,000 controls. The average age was about 68 and 37% of them were female. And what they, they looked at um, drug therapy as monotherapy, as combination therapy. And what they found is that although in unadjusted models, there, there was an association, when they did a multivariable variab variable adjustment, they found no, no association between um, treatment uh, with these medications and the risk of um, developing COVID-19. Uh, they looked at multiple subgroups, including gender, they looked at age, they looked at severity of disease, and found no association with any of these. The last study um, that I want to talk about is um, the, this third one by Mara et al. And this was actually an international study looking at 169 hospitals in Asia, Europe, and North America. 17% of the uh, patients were from North America. 
and it was an observational study of 8,900 hospitalized patients, 40% were female. And what they were looking for were to see what were the risk factors that were associated with um, mortality in these patients. And what they found, excuse me, what they found was that there was no association with increased mortality with ACE inhibitors or ARBs. There was a suggestion of possible protection with ACE inhibitors, but this has to only be hypothesis generating since the, the authors did not adjust for multiple, very, um, multiple um, comparisons. And so um, we cannot use this to change clinical practice at this time. So the summary of current data available supports the AHA, ACC, and HFSA statement to continue grasp blockade in patients at risk and who have COVID-19. The only reason to stop them at this time would be um, hemodynamics or renal dysfunction or some other clinical uh, reason. There is no suggestion of harm using RAS inhibitors. Um, no association with COVID positivity, no association with severe, severity of disease, and no association with increased mortality. Possible bene benefit with ACE inhibitors, but not ARBs. Again, this is just hypothesis generating and should not alter therapy. And I want to remind everyone that these are still all observational studies with obvious limitations and confounding and require additional randomized studies for a definitive answer. There is an ongoing study called the Replace COVID-19 study. Um, the principal investigators are at Penn, and the study is looking at patients who are admitted for COVID-19 to the hospital and trying to see the compare. Um, it's a randomized study to um, stop or continue RAS blockade, and um, this is this, this is the kind of study that we're going to need in order to truly answer the question and re remove the confounding that is associated with these observational study. I did hear of another study that is currently under FDA um, review, and it is looking at um, giving oral ACE2 or angiotensin um, um, angiotensin treatment orally in order to try to see if there is a protective effect in patients and outpatients. So that is currently under FDA review and hopefully will start later this summer. And that's it. So next I want to present our next speaker who actually needs no introduction with this audience. But for those of you who might not know him, Dr. Daniel Soffer is a clinical associate professor of medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. His clinical focus is clinical lipidology, preventive cardio cardio cardiology, and general internal medicine. Dr. Soffer sits on the board of directors of the Northeast Chapter of the National Lipid Association and on the steering committee of the Philadelphia Lipid and Atherosclerosis Club. Dr. Soffer. Dr. Singhali, thank you very much. That was fantastic. I, I actually, I had not heard that about the uh, ACE versus ARB issue, and, and uh, I look forward to learning more about that. Um, before I launch in on um, talking about apheresis myself, I'm going to uh, raise my glass uh, as well. This, so this is sort of like a Passover Seder. I think we're on our third glass of wine. I'd like to, to propose a toast to all of uh, you folks who are on the front lines who are really feeling the stress of this env uh, environment that is ever changing and the impact it has on all of us in the health field, healthcare field, not to mention all of the other folks that are being affected by this on an ongoing basis, which is just really uh, just brutal on, on everybody. And so uh, here's to all of you. I won't drink the entire glass. So, um, <clears throat> Let's see, I had control a second ago of this. Um, so I, actually, I, I'd like to um, just go back to the title slide. Uh, lipoprotein apheresis is not a treatment for COVID-19. So if you have to leave early, now you know the, uh, the, the, the um, 
the gist of the talk and, and the conclusions already. But I, I just wanted to point that out right off the bat that I, I wanted to uh, jump in and talk about apheresis and its role here and uh, just lead off with the conclusion. So this was all started, this conversation was all started by a Twitter, uh, by a tweet by a colleague in Chicago. There we go. And who wrote, uh, I have FH patients requiring LDL apheresis. And is it even a possibility in the times of COVID-19? Do we know if the equipment can be properly sterilized? That was her, you know, her original concern. And this was going back, I, I'm going to say close to eight weeks ago. And it, it really got the ball rolling. A big Twitter conversation started between people who I know who are involved with lipoprotein apheresis. It led to further conversation with some of our critical care specialists. It led to conversation with um, uh, the rest of the apheresis team at our institution and some apheresis people around the country. And uh, I, I thought I'd share some of those thoughts with everybody um, uh, tonight. So one of the things I learned was that uh, the, the topic in general is not referred to as apheresis. It's referred to as extracorporeal blood purification, which to me just sounded very medieval. And indeed, it is a medieval uh, process. This is a therapy that dates back to medieval times. And you can see this uh, poor gentleman here who actually looks fairly robust and strong is having a bloodletting. And um, so sort of the out with the bad. And then I gather that's a dog perhaps that uh, is donating uh, the, the healthy blood to the dog, uh, from the dog to the person. And that is somehow supposed to make them better. That's the in with the good. Um, but in general terms, uh, apheresis is a process where blood is taken out. Uh, the components of blood can be separated outside the body and components that need to be removed can be separated and re removed from the body and the, everything else can be returned to the body. And uh, so that's just blood purification in, in general. Um, and for lipoprotein apheresis, sorry, we're having some, having some technical uh, issues here. For lipoprotein apheresis, what we know is that it's specific for the lipoproteins, and spe specifically it's the ApoB-containing lipoproteins or the atherogenic lipoproteins, uh, notably LDL, VLDL, and LPA, the hepatically derived lipoproteins, as opposed to uh, using it for chylomicron removal. Um, in addition to lowering those levels tremendously, it also has beneficial effects on some of the inflammatory cytokines, including C-reactive protein, and other cytokines that contribute to elevated levels of C-reactive protein, as well as fibrinogen and uh, blood rheology is affected as well. And apheresis spares some of the other things that you may be concerned about. If it's removing all those bad things, can it remove some of the good things like HDL, albumin, and immunoglobulin? And the answer is no, it doesn't remove those things. Um, and LPA, L lipoprotein apheresis has been associated with reductions in cardiovascular event rates which I'm sure some of you uh, know about already. These are the different types of lipoprotein apheresis that are available in the United States. I encircled the one in red because that's the one that we use at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, is used widely throughout the United States and around the world. It's not the exclusive uh, lipoprotein apheresis, but it's the most commonly one used. It uses a dextran sulfate uh, cartridge, which has a very strong negative charge associated with it. And that negative charge creates an, a strong electrostatic attraction to the positively charged apolipoprotein B. And by that uh, strong attraction, it's able to actually remove those particles from the bloodstream and, and remove them onto the, the cartridge and allow everything else to pass through. So um, the indications for lipoprotein apheresis with a dextran sulfate uh, cartridge are as follows. Some of you may already know this. There's four groups. Uh, the fourth group was just added on April 21st by the FDA, but the first three you may be familiar with, that individuals with hom homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and LDL cholesterol greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter um, are, um, can access a apheresis. Heterozygote patients with LDL cholesterol greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter can access it. And individuals who have heterozygous FH and an LDL cholesterol uh, greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per deciliter and documented CAD or PAD can have access to apheresis as well. And that may be a lot lower than what some of you are familiar with um, 
and you may have it in your mind that 200 milligrams per deciliter was the uh, was the old number that they used as a threshold, and then they lowered it to 160, and then most recently uh, to 100. And then the, the most recent indication was literally uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, where the FDA approved apheresis for individuals with heterozygous FH and LDL cholesterol level greater than or equal to 100 milligrams per deciliter, and who also have an LPA level that's greater than or equal to 60 milligrams per deciliter, roughly two times the upper limit of normal. And that's as long as they have coronary artery disease and or peripheral arterial disease. And I just want to say one, one note that I think is interesting about the documentation of uh, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The FDA is actually fairly loose about what they consider CAD and PAD. And you can see the, the uh, description of it um, in, at the bottom of the slide that even radiographic demonstration of atherosclerosis was adequate. And I only bring that up because I know a lot of people in the audience are familiar with the phenomena of prescribing PCSK9 inhibitors in people with uh, severe radiographic atherosclerosis only to have them rejected because they never had a clinical event. And so the threshold for getting apheresis approved is actually lower than the threshold for getting PCSK9 inhibitors approved in uh, patients on the basis of the amount of atherosclerosis present. Now, by, by true to form, it, it really is for FH patients. And so uh, it, it's, there's a little bit of nuance there that, I, that I'll leave out. <clears throat> um, and so you probably know that uh, apheresis then removes the toxins. And the toxins that we're talking about here are LDL particles and uh, removes cytokines as well. So you may be familiar with the classic sawtooth pattern associated with LDL cholesterol reduction from apheresis, that there's an initial drop, there's a, a, severe, a significant drop that can be as much as 70 plus percent uh, in the LDL cholesterol with the, each treatment. There's a pretty rapid rise in the LDL cholesterol in the week or two following treatment such that the level is restored pretty much back to the pre-apheresis level. After about four or five treatments, however, you'll see that the baseline uh, peak LDL cholesterol does tend to come down uh, to, a, to a lower level as you reach steady state in a, in a regular every two week or in the case of homozygous patients in, an every, in a weekly uh, therapeutic interval. The C-reactive protein level is immediately reduced uh, with a single treatment. You'll see if you, if you look at the C-reactive protein level represented in this uh, bar at, at its highest level before apheresis, after a single episode, you get an immediate reduction. And then after in chronic therapy with the apheresis will give you a reduction in the peak. And, and that's sort of analogous to the LDL cholesterol reduction. So how does this pertain to um, uh, COVID-19 and how do, we, how do we answer that Twitter question that was raised? Um, I, I think you have to think about our patients who generally are getting apheresis who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So, you know, you can imagine that if they develop the disease, um, they are at very high risk, as we learned from both doctors Corrales and Sangavi, of becoming critically ill. As a matter of fact, ASCVD is one of those major risk factors for severe uh, critical illness uh, from the disease. And that's, you know, worst case scenario. Alternatively, if, they're, if they, under, if they uh, get infected with COVID-19 and they're getting apheresis on a regular basis and you're removing cytokines along the way, is it possible that the removal of these cytokines may actually offer some benefit? And this was what uh, a few on Twitter and amongst the apheresis crowd were suggesting as a possibility. And if your cytokines are being removed, then might you return to a, a, that previously healthy state and be, um, be better for it? And that, so in some way, apheresis, L lipoprotein apheresis is somehow therapeutic for that. Another possibility that was raised um, after a, um, um, an er a, a um, authorization request for a new apheresis pr uh, procedure was uh, proposed by the F to the FDA is that could a special type of apheresis, not like a protein apheresis, but a different type of apheresis, be used to in patients who are just revving up cytokine storm and so that this process could remove cytokines at a level to keep critically ill patients from becoming uh, even more critically ill. And two different processes were actually FDA approved 
uh, to, towards that effect. And so we don't know the answer to what would happen if you took somebody with a COVID-19 infection and did apheresis, not like a protein apheresis, but a, a, a more generalized cytokine-directed apheresis. And uh, would you make them better or are they going to get worse or is, are they going to even tolerate the procedure? So that's a question that's up in the air. But the, probably the, the, the one use of apheresis that's going to stick and be in everyone's minds and, and, and not so much lipoprotein apheresis, but apheresis in order to remove convalescent plasma from patients who have gotten over COVID-19 infections. And so in a, in a way, convalescent plasma is really the, the main use of apheresis, not lipoprotein apheresis. Um, and so, again, the, the hypotheses that were raised um, um, when, when this uh, infection started and, and, and conversations between people uh, came up was uh, maybe if we did apheresis, lipoprotein apheresis early, it might have some impact um, with removal of viral, viral particles, and would that help prevent some of the severity of the disease? Alternatively, what if you got to the patients after they were already symptomatic and uh, viral replication is already on its way down as, immu as innate immunity is on its way up? That's where cytokines are starting to rev up. And could the potential cytokine reduction from lipoprotein apheresis have some benefits there? And finally, that last question of uh, does uh, doing any type of apheresis, let alone lipoprotein apheresis, have any impact if you do it as the cytokine storm is revving up too. And those are the, the main uh, uh, therapeutic questions that have still yet to be answered. So there are some models for looking at this uh, in sepsis as the, as the main model. And the concept is uh, if you do some therapy that removes cytokines or endotoxins, for example, is there going to be any benefit? So there were some early studies that suggested some benefit. And then when it was uh, expanded to larger uh, programs and randomized placebo-controlled trials, uh, it looked like cytokine-directed uh, removal was neutral for sepsis and endotoxin removal also neutral with even a, an even larger study. Uh, plasma exchange um, may show some signs of uh, uh, benefit and uh, some promising early results for, for sepsis. And that's basically you, uh, you, you literally exchange the plasma of, of the sick person with healthy plasma, which is full of um, uh, most, you know, clotting factors and, and lots of other things. Um, doing that in a patient who has COVID-19, as you all know, might be uh, particularly dangerous uh, since most of the complications that we're seeing, or many of the complications we're seeing from the critically ill patients with COVID-19 are related to clotting and giving them clotting factors may not be the best approach here, especially while we're trying to anticoagulate them. Um, so some very interesting questions still remain with regards to apheresis in general, and, um, but I think that the, the, the benefits of lipoprotein apheresis look like they're negligible. And um, one thing I didn't mention before about that is that the, the process that we use, the dextran sulfate, also and results in a release of bradykinin, which is probably not a good thing for critically ill patients, uh, uh, could, may contribute to, more to their hypotension. And so I mentioned earlier that the uh, emergency use authorization for two different apheresis processes for uh, cytokine storm. And then finally, I just want to finish up talking about uh, con this convalescent plasma issue for COVID-19. Uh, this is also not a new therapy. It, it dates back at least in, uh, to the last part of the 19th century with diphtheria and rabies and, and several other different viruses. And uh, there is evidence for benefit in, in different studies. And the FDA actually has ongoing um, IND uh, rapid access uh, for convalescent serum programs. And they are trying to do this in a relatively controlled manner so that, it's, so that there are some controls against which uh, this can be compared. And they're looking at basically like a four to one ratio of treatment versus control. And um, uh, this, there's some early data that, out of China and um, and I'll show you the data in a second from Houston Methodist, which started on March 28th. And at Penn, we have a study that started on, or that was initiated on April 17th, and they're hoping to get 50 patients in this. And so there are uh, ways to get convalescent uh, serum, uh, convalescent plasma as part of the therapeutic intervention. So again, this was posted on Twitter yesterday, yesterday and this was uh, data from the 25 patients at Houston Methodist that have un who have received convalescent plasma. 
And uh, each of these horizontal bars represents one of the patients who has gotten the convalescent plasma. And at the far right of the bar, you'll see a square and all of the open squares are patients who have, are the patients who have been discharged. And you can see so far, now I don't have all the patient selection and, and how, um, uh, how sick each of, the, each of these patients were compared to other patients. And we don't have full control results, but you can see um, all of the patients survived except for uh, one of the patients who, who's deceased. And you can see about uh, seven or eight patients uh, down. It looks like number eight has a black uh, square at the end. So one deceased patient out of 25 and the rest have survived. So that's, uh, that's pretty promising that convalescent plasma will have some benefits. And so um, I think we can conclude that lipoprotein apheresis is not a treatment for COVID-19, but it's a very good treatment for atherosclerosis in general, um, and that there may be some other uses for apheresis in our sick patients, and there may be some other uses for plasma exchange as well, but it's not going to be the, the, of the lipoprotein uh, type. And so with that, I think we can turn this back over to questions. Great, Dan, that was a wonderful presentation and, and Monica as well. So um, kind of open it up to questions and, and there are a couple of questions that came in and um, one question had to do with regard to, is there any evidence about the dose of statin or the intensity of statin? And, and the one point that I wanna make and then, and then I wanna open up this question to the panelists is that um, we're, it's really unclear whether statins or even ACE inhibitors you know, really can reduce the complications for associated with COVID-19. And in the observational studies, these were patients who already were on statin, already on an ACE inhibitor when they came into the hospital. And, and one of the things that we do know is that it takes time. If you look at the acute MI trials, it takes time to show benefit of statin therapy. It, it doesn't happen in 24 and 48 hours. If you look at the heart failure trials, the hypertensive trials with ACE inhibitors, it takes time to show the benefit. So I don't know that ACE or ARBs are going to be a treatment for COVID-19, but we know they're at least safe. We know they reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Is, is some of this evidence that's coming out there, and as preventive cardiologists, as preventive internists, can we use this as the tipping point to now get our patients to improve lifestyle, to get on appropriate preventative strategies and achieve better blood pressure control, get them to stop smoking, get them on statin therapy, not only to reduce their event rate, but let them know that COVID-19 is here to stay. And your best chance, if you do contract it, of getting through it is not to have sort of, you know, untreated or unmodified risk factors. So I'm curious, in, in the patients you've seen, have you seen more willingness to now go with preventative treatments and preventative strategies in the era of COVID-19, given some of the things that we've talked about today. So Dan or Monica? Yeah, I can, I can say that I have had a few patients who had been reluctant to start statins in the past, call me and say, you know, I'm really scared about COVID-19 and um, do you think this is a good time to start it? And so it's, it's, I think, maybe an opportunity, like you mentioned, to, to really um, counsel patients on mainly risk, pre um, risk prevention, um, since we know now that may, there's probably no harm in the COVID era. Dan, you, you, you agree? Yeah, I, I do. I think um, it's an interesting conversation. I mean, it, it, you know, the simple answer is, of course, optimize everything you possibly can. But I had an interesting conversation with a good friend who actually asked me about the use of vitamins and some other su dietary supplements that he felt that if you could just be a healthy person, that you wouldn't succumb to COVID-19. And I think that's a little too simplistic way to look at it. And, and I just think um, you know, it's, you have to be careful when having this conversation with patients to, to, to not make a claim of if you take your statin and your ACE inhibitor that you're going to be much healthier and therefore not going to succumb to these diseases. You know, it's, it, it's still all just a matter of the way you communicate the, the issue, I think, and, you know, so, but in principle, yes, absolutely. Optimize the cardiometabolic health every way you possibly can. That seems to be at least a risk factor. So it's, it's sensible to optimize that. 
one of the other questions came in about, you know, what are the risk factors for the serious complications? And, you know, in, in some studies, diabetes appears to be a risk factor, but other studies, there may be conflicting evidence about diabetics. Um, and one of the things that we know is that diabetes is a very heterogeneous population. So you've got patients that have type 2 diabetes, and if you do calcium scoring or coronary CTA, they have a zero calcium score and no coronary disease. You take other patients who don't have diabetes but may have metabolic syndrome and they have extensive subclinical vascular disease. So do you think that when we start looking at what these risk factors are, knowing that, you know, that, that cardiovascular disease is, is really the link when you get really ill and tends to sort of portend increased complications and death with elevated troponins, with other issues that occur, do you think that it's the risk factors that may be leading to underlying unrecognized atherosclerotic vascular disease? And that may be what puts people at risk. And again, you know, we've seen young people who are otherwise healthier, but we know there's young people that have unrecognized vascular disease as well. So do you think that the ASCVD may be the link? And that's what is linking all these other risk factors into what identifies a patient who may be at high risk of these complications? It's a good question. I mean, it's a good question. And obviously, um, it, we're speculating, you know, at this time in terms of what we think. But, you know, I, there is also something that's come out that obesity is a big, um, is a risk factor for, I think, ICU admissions. And so I wonder if um, obesity may be a common link too with the hypertension and the diabetes that we're seeing. So I'm not sure if if it's the underlying atherosclerosis, it's the obesity, which puts them at further risk for respiratory failure when, they, when they're when they hypoxic and can't come. I'm not sure, you know, but I think all of these questions are really interesting. And, um, you know, but we do see that obesity may be a common link there too, in addition to underlying cardiovascular disease. You know, I it, it, that's that's a good point. The um, I, I can't really answer the question, Dean. It's a, it's it's over my head, frankly. But the, I will tell you that um, you know what seems to be one of the common features to some part of the severity that's being described is this hypercoagulable state. And uh, one of the attendees asked a question about um, I think it was a mis a mis misprint here LDL. They, I think they meant LPA and plasminogen. And um, I guess in, in reference to talking about apheresis and uh, removal of ApoB containing lipoproteins, if you're removing LPA in somebody who has very high levels of uh, LPA, they may have more uh, likelihood of uh, being in a prothrombotic state. And you know, is there some sort of contribution from that? Um, and so, as a link to the cardiometabolic conditions that you described. They're, they may be more prone to that prothrombotic state. They, with obesity and diabetes, are both highly prothrombotic states to begin with. You know, we don't think of them as causing venous thrombosis, um, but they are highly prone to uh, atherothrombosis and and uh, other uh, thrombotic complications. So I think that there's. Uh, I think like any, like a lot of things, this is a multifactorial disease process and complicated, but. Um, it is curious to know whether diabetes has inconsistencies because of its heterogeneity, or maybe there's uh, certain aspects of diabetes that are um, more harmful to the people who get sick with this and other aspects that are less harmful. And, and one of the other things too that we have to take into account is you know, that we're seeing observational studies from around the world, China, United States, other places. And, and there may be differences, you know, ethnic racial issues, um, you know, that, that, that portend maybe different prognosis if someone contracts in addition to age and other associated risk factors. I mean, we know that there's in areas that have more concentrated, you know, ethnic groups, we see a higher risk of serious complications. You know, is that because they're just closer together, especially in these cities like Philadelphia, New York, et cetera? Or is it that there's, we know there's a higher proportion of, you know, hypertension and diabetes and metabolic syndrome, you know, in these individuals as well. So I have a question for Monica. And um, we know that there's gender differences, you know, in, in, in both atherosclerotic vasculitis and presentation. Um, I've not seen anything in the literature as it relates to gender issues. Um, have you seen anything is with regard to men and women? Are women at higher risk, less risk as compared to men? 
Does age factor, does gender play any role in, in what the risk is if you were to contract COVID-19 as it relates to cardiovascular risk? That's a good question. The, when they looked at um, the likelihood of RAS inhibition affecting outcomes, um, they, if you're on a RAS inhibitor, the risk of hospitalization or, or sorry, the risk of developing COVID or the risk of um, severe COVID disease, they didn't see any differences based on gender. But that the study, the international study that I mentioned by Mara et al., the way that the same thing, you know, they found that ACE inhibitors may be slightly protective. They also mentioned that female gender may be slightly protective against mortality. But again, because they did so many comparisons and they didn't um, account for those, it is only hypothesis generated that maybe female gender may be protective against COVID mortality, but we cannot, um, I don't think we can make any conclusions for sure. But that was an interesting finding in their study that female gender was um, associated with decreased mortality. And, wow. and it was an international study. Yeah, you know, I mean, a, another question came in about, you know, uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled risk factors. Um, in, and, you know, is there any evidence that when we start to look at this hyperinflammatory response, do uncontrolled risk factors, do they add to that? And, and do they potentially, could they potentiate that inflammatory response and increase and lead to a, to a high risk of serious complications? I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on that. I don't think, like the, the data that I looked at didn't look at that granularity. It was just the presence of hypertension or diabetes. Um, I didn't see anything looking at, um, further looking at hypertension, whether it's controlled or not controlled. They didn't look at numbers that I saw, but. So we, we have just probably a few more minutes and then we'll stop. But I have a question for both of you. And, um, and, and I know this has come up in, in, in some talks we've had before, um, you know, the PCSK9 inhibitors. One of the side effects, though it's not as common, but it can occur is severe nasopharyngitis. Um, are you have any concerns in, in about using any of the PCSK9 inhibitors and mimicking some of the symptoms that may occur with COVID-19 and when, what have you done in your practice, you know, with that or even with some of the newer, you know, um, lipid lowering drugs that, you know, patients have not had opportunities really to know much about. Do we have any concerns about using any of these newer drugs or the PCSK9 inhibitors and potentially mimicking some of the side effects or symptoms of, of COVID and, and how do you handle that in your clinical practice? Yeah, I, I presume that one's for me. <laughs> um, Dean, I, I, I mean, uh, Doug Jacoby and I chatted about that a little bit um, a couple months ago, and we, I think we both com, uh, concluded the same thing, which is just let people know that uh, a small percentage can have nasopharyngitis, and, um, and rarely do we ever have to stop the medicine for that. And obviously, at this time, when there's this you know, virus running through our, our community, it's, it's a concern that it could mimic some of those symptoms. But uh, if you stay in communication with the patient and you, and you, and you talk to them, and you can, you, I think you can talk them through. And if it clearly happens after the injection and wanes uh, over the next couple of days as the injection goes away and then it comes back again the next injection, then you know it's from the medicine and, not, and nothing more severe. And, and I think you can tell the difference between uh, a real illness and um, and, and that problem. So I just, I, you know, um, do you mind if I, I just wanted to make a comment about the, you had asked about the, the, um, at some of the ethnic variation. And I just wanted to make a comment that there's there, you know, I don't know this literature very well, but I've seen, um, some back and forth about, uh, about this. And I know there's already published literature about the socioeconomic differences within the United States. And that one of the greatest contributors to, uh, the socioeconomic uh, to the ethnic differences in mortality has more to do with uh, public transportation and multifamily, multi multi generational households, and more of a an economic issue than a than a true uh, biologic uh, genetic variance in, in response to the disease. And and I think that's that's important to to point out. And uh, Dr. Goldberg asked a question I think is really interesting, and it's it's sort of along the same lines. He asked, where did all the STEMIs go during this time? Like, where, you know, everyone's been reporting that 
people aren't coming in with the same number of heart attacks that they used to? Is it that they're saving them up and they're all going to come in um, when there's an all, all clear? And uh, Dean, uh, Dean and Monica, I wonder if you guys can comment on that. Well, you know, there, there was actually a study that came out of Italy that showed that they were having less admissions for acute myocardial infarction. But the concern was is that some of the outpatient deaths that were attributed to COVID-19 may actually have been to unrecognized myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we have the answer yet, um, but I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, but I am concerned that patients may be staying home through their infarct. Um, and what will be very interesting is down the road to see what the outcomes are six months from now, a year or now, two years from now, both to see have the outcomes gotten worse and also a test of the way we care for patients. And, you know, with the frequent visits, the testing that we do, you know, has that really impacted? Because now with less testing, if patients have the same outcomes, it, it really is going to change, I think, the way we practice. So it's getting past the time. So I, I want to thank everybody. I think the take home message is we need to do our job as preventive physicians in order to do the best we can to prevent cardiovascular and that's the best way to keep everybody healthy. So I, I want to thank everyone, Monica and Dan for, for, for co-hosting this with me and for everyone who's still on, thank you for participating in the very first CVI and plaque virtual webinar. Uh, please remember to take the brief online evaluation that will be mailed to you shortly uh, and please stay safe um, and stay well. So uh, I'm sure we'll be doing this again soon. Um, and uh, everybody have a good night. Good night. Cheers. Cheers. Good night.